Okay, great. So um, thank you so much for inviting me to the organizers. It's uh, been a great experience so far, and uh, I'm sure the rest of the week is going to be equally good. And um, If any of you wants to just skip the talk and go out and enjoy that food out there, I would totally understand. <laughs> it was really good. Okay. So I want to talk about um, uh, rhythmic communication uh, and from a sort of a neurodynamic point of view, and I hope it will become clear uh, as I go what I mean by neurodynamics. Um, one sort of may, perhaps point of departure from some of the talks we heard at the, the last part of the morning is here now I'm, I'm really thinking about how a listener experiences music rather than as a musician who's performing music. So this idea of reference uh, maybe might not exactly uh, be the one we want to think about here. So um, what I want to do, uh, rather than starting out with meter and downbeats and so forth, is to think about uh, the time scales over which music occurs. So what I've done here is I've uh, given a scale of, uh, of frequencies, a logarithmic scale of frequencies, so 10 to the third, that's 1,000 hertz, this is 100 hertz, this is 10 hertz, this is 1 hertz, and this is 1 tenth of 1 hertz. Okay, and if we try and place the time scales of music along this kind of a continuum, we'll see that pitch uh, starts at perhaps around 30 hertz, uh, according to some recent uh, experiments uh, that I'm aware of, and um, extends up to somewhere uh, between four, around 4,000 hertz. Okay. And then if we think about rhythm, uh, and we use uh, a paper of Bruno, recent papers of Bruno Rep, we'd say that uh, rhythm starts maybe at around 8 hertz, uh, perhaps up to 10, but here I've, I've drawn 8, and extends down, and as far as we know, there's no absolute uh, time scale at which, you know, something stops being a rhythm. Um, okay, now we can listen to some stimuli here. <laughs> Sounds nice, doesn't it? Um, th that, that is a sequence of pulses. Um, uh, repeated at five milliseconds. And what that uh, produces for us is the percept of a pitch, a very unpleasant pitch in this case. But if we take exactly the same sequence of pulses and repeat it uh, at two orders of magnitude slower, at two hertz rather than 200 hertz, we get a very different kind of a percept. Okay, you get a kind of a house beat. Now, um, there's also this area where I don't have any musical percept indicated, somewhere between rhythm and pitch. We could actually repeat our pulses at a rate of 20 hertz, and you see what that sounds like anyway. It's kind of a rather unpleasant uh, sound. In fact, if that sound were uh, created by the interaction of two sinusoids, we might call that dissonance. Okay. Uh, but today I want to focus on uh, musical rhythm and pulse. Uh, so here what I've just indicated is that pulse, and, and I've, here I've drawn the limits of pulse according to the limits of a metronome. Okay, we could try and determine the limits of pulse uh, empirically. I haven't done that here. Um, and then what I just show is, you know, um, that we have this metrical hierarchy. So if we, if we put our basic pulse at two hertz, uh, then the eighth notes would be four hertz and half notes would be one hertz and so forth. Now what's interesting to do then is try and relate these time scales uh, to the time scales that we know uh, in terms of uh, brain mechanisms and brain function. Um, so we could think uh, in terms of the delta band, um, and what we would notice is that the delta band approximately seems to correspond with what we typically call pulse or what, um, uh, what Steve referred to as that intermediate, you know, sort of optimal zone uh, for, for musical pulses. Um, in the, the fast zone, uh, maybe corresponds a little bit better to the theta band. Okay. Now if we move up into this rhythm in be in, into this region between rhythm and pitch, we'd find the alpha band, what's typically called the alpha band, and the beta band. Uh, the beta band you may uh, know as the, as the frequency band at which the uh, motor system tends to operate. And then if we go up even higher, beginning let's say around 30 hertz, and of course these boundaries you know differ depending on. Uh, uh, the situation, but um, then we would be talking about the gamma band, okay? So uh, what I want to think about then is the, the rhythms of the brain and how they interact with incoming musical stimuli. 
Oh, sorry, and I've got uh, one sort of assertion there, which is that um, well, I want to sort of take the, the, the position that really the brain is resonating to music at multiple time scales. Okay, and we want to take a look at that. Okay, so rhythms of music and rhythms of the brain. Um, so uh, in 1999, Mari Jones and I um, published this sort of theory of dynamic attending that a number of people have picked on. And what we uh, picked up on and what we sort of said is that um, when you listen to a rhythm, it entrains some kind of internal oscillation, uh, which we uh, thought of as pulses of attending energy. So if we think of, you know, a uh, uh, pulse of attention as occurring at some point in that uh, cycle, then we got what we called an attending rhythm. And uh, we had some uh, way of formalizing that mathematically, and we used it to uh, predict some data. So. I think here we've got, uh, where's, so, somewhere in here I have uh, both uh, predicted and, um, oh yeah, there's the simulated. These are the predictions over here and these are the data. Okay, so we use this model to sort of predict some data and time discrimination. Um, a couple years later we became interested in my lab in trying to decide, trying to see if we could find neural correlates of this process. So this is a study that was run by Joel Snyder when he came down to our lab to work on his dissertation. And we had a number of different sequences. And what I'm going to show you is simply uh, from this experiment is the periodic control, what happened uh, in the brains of our participants when they just listened to a periodic rhythm. Okay. And I should say uh, in this talk, in the interest of time, I've sort of deleted all the methodology slides. So there's a lot of important methodology here um, that I can answer questions about later. So we looked at this kind of a montage of electrodes and the ones shown here and the time frequency uh, domain are the ones that are darkened up here or, or lightened, the brighter ones. Um, and here we see the evoked response in EEG and an induced response. And if we focus in on this electrode here, which is one that's typically looked at as uh, um, showing you what's happening in auditory cortex, uh, what we see here are the events. So here's one event and here's another. The rate here is about 400 milliseconds. And what we see is um, a, a brain response, and uh, this goes from uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 hertz. We see a brain response at about 25 hertz that follows the onset of this stimulus, about 50 milliseconds after the stimulus begins. If we look at the induced response in EEG, which is essentially just a different way of, of looking what's hap happening at these higher frequencies, uh, we see that the response tends to be uh, more frontal and lateralized. So if we look at what's going on in this electrode, for example, we see something rather different. We see a response in which the peak response actually precedes the onset of the tone. Okay? So what we um, sort of tentatively concluded in this, in this study was that if you look at the induced response, what you're seeing is sort of an expect expectancy of when tones uh, will occur, whereas the evoked response was more of a, a response to a sound actually occurring. Okay? And in, we had different conditions where we left out tones and found the evoked response was preserved and so forth. Um, when I talked about this uh, with Robert Satori and I was visiting uh, up in Montreal, um, and we were, uh, I was wondering you know, where this uh, response was originating, he made a rather startling suggestion to me. I thought this was you know, sort of expectancy. He said, no, I think it's probably coming from the motor, uh, motor cortex. Um, and sure enough, a couple of years later, they published this very uh, beautiful paper that showed even when subjects simply listen to music that has a beat, um, that those uh, sounds tend to activate motor areas of the brain. Okay, so this was published in 2008. Um, and I think it sort of um, was a wake-up call to many of us who are working in this area and said, listen, when you're listening to music that has this kind of a structure, motor areas are probably important in what's going on. Um, uh, uh, a year later, uh, Jessica Gron and colleagues published some data that suggest that the basal ganglia are extremely important in the perception of the beat. Okay, and, and the Zatori group has uh, recently published a, a paper um, uh, about the involvement of basal ganglia as well. Um, so uh, a couple of years later now, we're, we're up to 2011, um, and there is this sort of beautiful result by um, Sylvie Nazordan uh, working with Isabel in collaboration with Isabel Peretz, 
And what they did was they took a subjective meter approach and they had this rather complicated looking sound and I'm gonna sort of ignore the methodology, but where there's a sort of a fundamental periodicity at 2.4 hertz. And they, they had three listening conditions and they asked subjects, first of all, just listen to that uh, periodic or sort of pseudo periodic sound. In the second condition, imagine it grouped into groups of two. So strong, weak, strong, weak, or one, two, one, two. And in the third condition, imagine it grouped into uh, groups of three. And here we see a Fourier analysis of the sound envelope, and we see uh, that there's energy at 2.4 hertz, but not at 1.2 hertz, and not at 0.8 hertz, which would be the twos and the threes. And they found what I think is just truly astonishing. So when people listen, so remember now, we're looking at, at, at brain rhythms sort of in the delta band, which is the one that's coincidence with the, this uh, sweet spot for musical rhythm. Uh, when you just listen, you, uh, your brain is responding at 2.4 hertz, which is physically present in the stimulus. Um, but when you group into twos, uh, there is actually a rhythmic response at half that frequency. So your brain is responding at a subharmonic of the frequency present in the sound. And when you're asked to group into threes, you have a subharmonic, a third subharmonic appears. And even a harmonic of the third subharmonic. So some, some really astonishing things are going on as the brain is simulated with rhythm. Um, one uh, last empirical result that I want to mention before I go on to um, you know, mess this all up with theory is that um, in, in uh, 2012, uh, uh, Takako Fujioka uh, and, and a group uh, that I work with um, published what, we, what originally started out to be a replication of Large and Snyder using MEG. So this is the original Large and Snyder uh, periodic stimulus, and these are just the periodic stimuli from that experiment. Um, and this is MEG in auditory cortex, and these arrows here are where the sound occurs. And we, in fact, did replicate Large and Snyder, so this evoked response does tend to precede the stimulus. And these are individual subjects, by the way. This is the group average. Uh, we also used um, different tempos. So this is uh, um, five, what is that, 585 milliseconds, and then this, this is uh, half as fast. Um, and we see nice, reliable responses, again, that where the peak precedes the event. And we also included a random con condition to show that this doesn't happen when the stimulus is random. Um, this analysis actually shows using, we use this half max um, criterion and th this trough criterion to show that um, the peak occurs at about this location, or sorry, the, the half max on the way down in this desynchronization direction uh, always occurs at about the same spot, no matter what the tempo is. So does this trough. But in resynchronization, this depends on the tempo. So this is what is sensitive to the tempo. And again, it doesn't happen in the random condition. So these brain rhythms really are adapting to the tempo that we present. Not only that, because we are in MEG now, we can do a kind of a source localization, almost um, uh, almost uh, like a fMRI, and what we find is those rhythms are present not only in the auditory cortex, but also in motor areas of the brain. Okay, so what wasn't clear from the, um, from what, what can't be clarified from fMRI data is what's actually happening in those motor areas. What this shows is that those motor areas have the same sort of rhythmic activation. And it, our analysis, in fact, suggests that this communication between auditory and motor areas is somehow carried by the beta band frequencies. Okay. Um, and all of this, I just want to point out, is consistent with this idea uh, that Charlie Schroeder uh, talked about uh, and Dr. Bazaki um, brought up in, in the conversation yesterday of an oscillatory hierarchy in auditory cortex where the phase of higher frequency oscillations, or sorry, the amplitude of higher frequency oscillations is actually modulated by the phase of the lower frequency oscillations. So this is probably a multi-frequency response. So the delta band is actually in training uh, to the stimulus at the rhythmic time scale, and that's controlling amplitude modulations in the beta and gamma bands and so forth. Okay. So I just want to quickly summarize uh, these um, empirical results. Uh, what we've seen are correlates of pulse and meter in the beta band, in the gamma band. Um, 
harmonic and subharmonic resonance in the delta band. Uh, our results are consistent with an oscillatory hierarchy and auditory cortex. Uh, there's motor cortex involvement, there are cortical striatal interactions, and uh, we seem to be seeing some auditory motor interactions in the beta band. Okay, now how are we going to use this? How are we going to incorporate all this information and try and uh, uh, develop an understanding of what might be happening sort of in the large in, in um, our responses to musical rhythms? Um, this is the slide I showed yesterday. I don't need to belabor this. I just want to show, uh, um, uh, just want to remind you. So if we take a very simple rhythm in which events tend to occur on strong beats of a meter, okay, and we look at a Fourier analysis of that. So I want you to think like physicists now. Let's just look at a Fourier analysis. What you see is a lot of energy at that frequency that we typically refer to as the pulse. But if I make this just a little bit more complicated by moving these events, as I showed you last night, uh, I create a sonne clave rhythm. And the Fourier analysis now shows lots a great reduction in energy at this frequency that uh, we might call the pulse. Okay, And if I get even a little more complicated and make this a rumba clave, There's almost no energy there at the pulse. And if, if I were to bring a typical Western subject in and listen to this rhythm, ask him to tap the pulse. Well, he might not be able to do it, I guess. But uh, he would tap at that frequency. So my conjecture then is, is what if the brain doesn't infer or compute the pulse or meter of a complex rhythm? What if it simply is resonating to music? And that somehow, even though these these frequencies aren't present in the rhythm. The nonlinear the complexities uh, of uh, nonlinear resonance uh, could actually create responses at these frequencies. Okay, so I, I have less than five minutes left now, but I'll try and uh, zip through this as quickly as I can. So our analysis goes like this: um, in uh, uh, in the brain. Uh, Oscillation can arise through simple circuits like this of excitatory neurons interacting with inhibitory neurons. And if you look in general at circuits like that, they can produce a number of different kinds of responses, from simply a spike in response to a stimulus, to a periodic train of action potentials, to rhythmic bursting, uh, to actually chaotic behavior, in fact. So you can get a great variety of behaviors from the circuit. What we're interested in are these periodic or rhythmic bursting uh, kinds of activities. Okay. And what we do then is we write down uh, equations for excitatory and inhibitory uh, populations and then we array these along a tonotopic or a frequency topic uh, gradient and, um, and then we stimulate these with sounds. Okay. So uh, in the model that I'm going to show you in a minute uh, you, we have one that represents, uh, let's say, auditory cortex, and then the one that represents a motor cortex. Okay. Our analysis involves taking these sort of funny-shaped limit cycles that are produced by the more neuro neurally realistic model uh, and writing them down in a kind of a normal form way, which produces perfect circles in this uh, state space and things that look like sines and cosines, and now we can actually do the math and produce predictions mathematically. Okay. Uh, I probably should uh, not belabor this slide, but just to say that this uh, normal form model is universal. In other words, we could even be getting a physiology a little bit wrong, but our predictions are still going to hold um, because anything that is a neural oscillator can be written down in this form. Uh, but in uh, 2010, we uh, published a paper in Physica D in which we extended this uh, normal form model into a fully expanded canonical model. And so these are nonlinearities that apply to the um, uh, input and to the intrinsic dynamics here. Okay. All right. So let me not uh, belabor that too much. I'm actually going to skip this slide in favor of one that's going to be uh, the most relevant one. <laughs> 
Okay, so these are the nonlinearities that apply to the stimulus. So X here is the stimulus, P is what we call a passive nonlinearity, and A is an active nonlinearity. It depends on the oscillator state itself. And it corresponds to this big, long, hairy looking uh, series. And the only reason I write this down is because it's directly relevant to the way this thing responds. So if I, uh, for, for example, stimulate this at some particular frequency, here is 200 hertz, but it could be 2 hertz, actually. Um, the oscillator network responds basically at 2 hertz. So that's basically a linear response. But if I increase the amplitude here, then what we see is this network responds at 2 hertz, but also at 4 hertz and 1 hertz. So at a harmonic and a subharmonic. If I increase the amplitude even further, uh, we see harmonics 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, and subharmonics 1 to 2 and 1 to 3. So this bank of oscillators is actually adding frequencies into this stimulus. Okay. Um, so that, and when I, when I first saw structures like this, um, it occurred to me, well, you've got 2 to 1, you've got 3 to 1, you've got 1 to 2, 1 to 3. This could be a way maybe of implementing a metrical hierarchy. So that was my first sort of, when I first saw that, that's what I thought. Um, let me just say how this uh, sequence works. So the, the model is actually very nice because each, there's a term in this series that gives rise to each one of these peaks. So those are the harmonics. Uh, these are terms that give rise to subharmonics. And there, he, even here we get a three to two kind of polyrhythm. Okay. All right. But so now when we put these together into a larger model, we can ask what does neural resonance actually predict? And it's actually quite a bit more complex than a simple uh, metrical hierarchy than we, that we might have originally uh, started out with. Okay, so what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to show you a couple of simulations and this will be the end, really. Um, so first I just want to show you what it does in response to an isochronous stimulus. Okay, a simple sequence of beats. Okay, this is the activity in the motor network. So there's the stimulus. And the hi-hat sound is the response of this peak. Okay, and you see what it gets is the frequency of the stimulus but also a harmonic and a subharmonic. Bruno Rep has found these harmonic responses, what he called subdivisions, and these subharmonic responses correspond to the things, for example, that uh, Nazoridan and Perez's uh, group found. Okay? So these, by the way, are the amplitudes, and this is the entire oscillation. Um, just to show you, you're not restricted to twos. So if we actually accent every third beat, okay, we do get a response down here in threes, in the third subharmonic. Okay. Now let's take a look at the rumba clave. Maybe. Now this network is wired to simulate a Western listener because we're doing experiments with Western listeners in our lab. And I could talk about what that means in response to the question. But recall that this 2 hertz frequency is almost completely absent from the stimulus. Yet this network, it's the first and strongest to respond. Um, we can also, this is our last example, uh, create rhythms in which there is exactly no energy at the, at the 2 hertz frequency, yet you'll hear it's not that exotic rhythm. So you would expect this to be the pulse. And this network, in fact, will recover that frequency. Okay. Now, do people actually do this? No. Do people do this? Oh, sorry. Yes, they do. So we can go from isochronous all the way down to these four rhythms here that have no energy at the pulse frequency. The blue is the Fourier transform, yet people mostly tap there. And if we ask about the predictions of the model, the model also predicts that. Okay. <clears throat> 
So just to quickly go to the conclusions, what does neural resonance predict? Well, actually, it predicts a lot of things. Okay? It predicts synchronization, but synchronization is actually the trivial one. So think about it this way. If I take a stimulus and I present it to the brain and the brain resonates at that frequency, well, that's pretty obvious, right? It would, would be surprising if it didn't resonate at that frequency, in fact. Um, but what, what uh, this mod kind of a model can predict is harmonic resonance, subharmonic resonance, and even responses at frequencies that aren't present in the stimulus at all. Um, and some other things which I didn't get a chance to show you. Okay. And one other thing that I just want to point out is there is now a model of learning, so we, we're beginning to work with learning and, and ask if you're exposed to particular sets of rhythms, how will these oscillators wire themselves together to produce uh, uh, possibly different responses? Okay. So just uh, thanks to my uh, lab and to my collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you.